Good day dear people, so here it is, the third and final part of an inner round. Last episode I revealed I had a badger visiting my garden as well as a few foxes. No way! In this episode I will attempt to build my first DSLR camera trap and capture a photo of these charismatic creatures exploring my garden during the night. But before we dive into my quite frankly shocking attempts at DIY, I thought we should pick up where we left off. At the end of last week's episode, I just set up the trail camera in a different spot in the garden to try and learn a bit more about what passes through. Oh. So the camera didn't fire uh, when I took this out, which isn't a good sign, <laughs> but we'll check it anyway. It turns out it had been working fine. There was just one particularly windy night that just kept setting it off and killed the battery. Checking through the footage, I was pretty surprised with what I found. I was getting at least one fox every night, and it wasn't uncommon to see two or three. There were a couple more surprises though. If you look closely, you can see this vixen is lactating, which means that there are a few fox cubs nearby, which is actually quite exciting. I wasn't sure at first, but if you look at this second clip, it confirms it. There was also a very unexpected discovery in the form of this fox with just three legs. At first I was worried for it, but after regaining its footing, you can see that it actually looks surprisingly healthy. A testament to the amount of food that can be found by wildlife in cities if it knows where to look. Perhaps the biggest surprise of all was the sheer number of individuals. Putting together all the clips I had from locations 1 and 2, I identified 5, possibly 6 individuals that passed through my garden every few days. With all this activity going on right under my nose, I was buzzing to get building my first DSLR camera trap. Or, try to. So here's the thing, today I'm planning to try and build and assemble my very first camera trap. I'm doing it on a budget, as previously discussed in other videos. It's not my strength building things, but we'll give it a go. But this is basically a table of everything so far. This is either gonna go brilliantly well, and I'm gonna be able to get amazing photos of foxes and possibly badgers in my garden, or just cause myself a lot of frustration. Um, it could even get stolen, which is a possibility, because it's in my front garden. Um, yeah, so good or bad, take your, take your guesses now, and <laughs> all will be revealed at the end of this video, I guess. Um, wish me luck. I guess the first thing to do is to run you all through each individual item that I'm working with nice and quickly. Uh, if you're not really interested in that, then skip to this time here. First up, a bit of inspiration. To be honest, this book has pretty much everything you'd need in order to learn how to take great camera trap photos at home. But as with most things, I'll mainly be using this just for inspiration. Wait for something to go wrong and then check it. Definitely not the most effective way to do things. Second, two flashes. As it turns out, I actually only have the means to use one of these at a time. The Nikon SB28 is meant to be the best because of its standby mode, which means that the batteries last a lot longer. But I wasn't sure if the Nikon would be compatible with my 70D, and I already had this old Canon, so I've got both at hand just in case. Wireless transmitter and receiver to fire the flash off the camera. I'm using the Camtraptions ones, which I borrowed from a friend. The most important thing here is to have ones that fire the flash as soon as the motion sensor is triggered. I am told there are other ones on the market, but these ones also do the job pretty well. Cables, for cabling. Camouflage tape, for covering stuff in camouflage. Standing knife, for cutting, always useful. Speaking of always useful, cable ties. You can never have too many. Never. Batteries, self-explanatory. A drill with specialist drill bit for cutting the window for the lens at the front of the case. A motion sensor, again, borrowed from a friend. Ah, the main case. A lot of people use a Peli case, the 1300 I think, but I checked the measurements online and they're very similar to this one and it's much, much cheaper, so it was no brainer really. These types of cases are made to hold expensive camera equipment and so as a result come with this removable foam on the inside. You can take the bits out in order to make it fit your camera exactly, which is perfect for wildlife camera traps. An 82mm UV filter to create the window for the lens a pack of screw mount adapters and an Arca Swiss plate for attaching to the bottom of the case so that I can mount it to mini tripods and other things like that. Silicon sealant to make sure everything stays waterproof. Plastic bags to cover the flash. You can make a proper case for these sorts of things but a plastic bag is just as effective and a lot cheaper. <laughs> security. More security. A lot of security. To lock it shut and to lock it to a tree or something like that. As I said, I'm right in the middle of a city, and I don't particularly trust what I leave in my front garden to be there the morning after. With everything assembled, the first job was to check all the components I had worked together to take the photo, though perhaps too predictably I was distracted and delayed by the badger photos. Then I placed the camera inside the case to make sure I was happy with how it would fit. In order to stop the case splitting, I then wrapped camouflage tape all the way around it before putting it on the ground and drilling a hole.
Yes, I am aware I missed focus here, but in my defence, I was using my usual vlogging camera to check the placement of the hole, and so couldn't actually see if I was in focus. I know, it's not an excuse, just saying. After I drilled the hole, I then had to fit the filter using the sealant. I placed the case on the table with a piece of cardboard protecting it. I put the filter in the hole and applied the sealant around the edges. I waited for a few hours for it to dry before doing the other side. It didn't need to look pretty, keeping it waterproof was the only priority. Which showed, to be honest. The next morning I drilled two holes into the bottom of the case and attached a small piece of wood, which I then drilled the tripod plate to, in order to be able to attach it to tripods. It was almost done. I now just had to cut and remove the sections of foam in order to make sure that the camera would fit securely. Obviously this is by no means an in-depth how-to video. I can recommend a video by Nature TTL though that I found really useful through all this. I've linked it below in the description. I positioned the camera under the hedge at the bottom of the garden, where I know I'd be guaranteed to have some foxes come through at least. I placed the flash to the left to light the fox from the side as it passed through. Ideally I would want two flashes, but as I'm on a budget and just getting started, I only have access to the one receiver, as a result can only use one flash. I left it about a week or so before collecting it to review the images. Checking through the images I found a few that had been successfully triggered. Unfortunately my inexperience with nighttime flash photography was really showing. Long shutter speeds are a great way of filling the rest of your shot with ambient light and getting a better idea of the surroundings of the subject. However, if the background is lit in any way, then the subject that had been previously frozen by the flash will start to show this ghosting effect. I was really disappointed at first, but after a quick call with my mate Jack, we came to the conclusion that there is actually the potential for quite an interesting photo using this ghosting effect, with a few tweaks of course. I adjusted the settings and set up the shot a couple more times after that but so far the best results have still been from the first setup. With two days left until the video is due to be uploaded, I set it up one last time, which brings us to today. It's the last day, well, today is the day that I'm uploading this video. Um, really wanna have something to show you guys. Um, one way to find out, I guess. So there should be a lot of plain white ones, that's fine. Um, basically, all the plain white ones are going to be overexposed when I set up during the daytime. It looks like there just wasn't a visitor last night, so I don't think it's actually failed. It just looks to have not set off last night. Unfortunately, I don't have any photos to show you, but that's wildlife photography. Sometimes you win some, sometimes you don't. I will eventually get a photo and I will share it on this YouTube channel when I eventually do. So I didn't get the shot. I recently spoke to my friend Matt about this. Well, that was a lad. <laughs> You'd be lucky if you had a seat. Nope, not that one. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> ah, that's the one. He's built his own camera trap too and managed to get some absolutely cracking results. He isn't a massive fan of the camera trap setups you can buy. Not because they're poor quality or anything like that, but because in his words, sometimes the magic of the craft can be lost. And to be honest, I think I'm going to have to agree with him. I'm not going to lie to you, if I could afford an off-the-shelf camera trap setup, I almost certainly would have bought one. Most seem well designed and of good quality, but I couldn't afford it, so I built one myself. In doing so, it's opened up a whole other side of photography that I was unaware of. And no, I don't mean camera traps, I mean building something to fit a purpose. Knowing that I have a complete customised setup in my garden as we speak, waiting to get the shot that I built it for, is a unique feeling. Yes, I haven't got the shot yet, but that really doesn't matter, because I know that one day I will. And when I do, it will be using something that I've built myself. And for me, that makes the final shot worth a whole lot more. So, I hope you enjoyed today's video, even if the end result wasn't there. Next week, we're back to the out and about episodes, so hopefully I'll see you then. Please make sure that if you are subscribed, you hit that notification bell, so that you don't miss any future videos. And if you did enjoy the video, then giving it a thumbs up is always appreciated. Oh, and this week's mystery link is quite a special one, because it involves three people that are featured on this channel. Matt, Ben, and Dan. So it's really worth checking this one out. Thanks for watching.